Hi, this is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial, bringing you more useful gardening and landscaping tips to help improve our environment. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Doug Landis, and Doug is a professor of insect ecology and biological control in the Department of Entomology at Michigan State University. Th- thank you for joining me, Doug. Well, thank you for having me, Kim. And um, I, you're also the director of the Landis Lab. I uh, wonder, wonder where they got that name from. <laughs> um, and um, you said you study the interaction of beneficial insects and landscape structure there. Explain that. Yeah, so when, you, when we would use the word landscape, people think of the landscaping that they have in their backyards or, uh, and around the home. Uh, when I use the term landscape, I'm, I'm really thinking about what you see from uh, 30,000 feet or so when you're flying into your, uh, into your local airport. The arrangement of habitats uh, at very large spatial scales. Mm-hmm. Turns out that the landscape structure is a primary driver of insect abundance and then the services uh, or the pests that, uh, that arise from them. Okay. And uh, I came across uh, your work, Doug, uh, through this wonderful uh, bulletin that's online called Attracting Beneficial Insects with Native Flowering Plants. And, and that was published in, in 2007, and uh, it's still a really um, useful and relevant work. Uh, how, did, how did you come to do that particular research? Yeah, I had a uh, um, master student, Anna Fiedler, uh, who at the time was casting about for uh, some ideas. And we had known that for decades, entomologists uh, have observed that uh, many beneficial insects, and by that I mean uh, insect natural enemies, the predators and parasitoids that kill uh, pest insects, and also pollinators, uh, require floral resources in their environment. And and for decades, um, entomologists have been making these observations about weeds in agri- agricultural systems or uh, native plants, and then using that to suggest uh, what people might call insectary plants, or plants that are particularly attractive to insects. And most of the literature had been really formulated around four or five species of plant uh, that are exotic to North America. Um, so things like dill um, uh, is, a, is a plant that's uh, very attractive to insects. Um, sweet alyssum is another one. But we just asked the question, why can't we use Michigan native plants to provide those same resources? And if we use uh, perennial plants, uh, they have the advantage of, uh, of growing over many years and could really create more stable habitats. And that was the genesis of this idea. And you worked with uh, local native plant uh, nurseries to come up with uh, a list of, of plants that were native to the Great Lakes region, is that right? Exactly. We mm-hmm. work with uh, uh, the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association and, and many of their individual nursery owners um, and have gotten really uh, great advice and wonderful relationships over the years, uh, helping us to, uh, to determine which plants are uh, available for testing, which ones they find uh, are uh, maybe attractive from their growing operations. And uh, obviously, if we want this to be applied, those plants have to be uh, accessible to the general public. So we focused on plants that are in the commercial trade uh, so that uh, when we do have uh, findings, uh, we're we're giving you ideas about plants that you have access to Mm -hmm. through native plant nurseries. And just looking at the the list of the 46 plants, um, I recognize quite a few as also being native in the Northeast and specifically in my area in New York. Um, mm-hmm. Things like wild strawberry, Fragaria virginiana, golden alexanders, Isuaria, et etc. So even though this is particular to Michigan, I think um, folks in uh, many parts of the country will benefit from this information. Yeah. They're, the plants are, you know, broadly native across uh, much of the eastern, uh, northeastern portion of the United States. So what were some of the, um, the beneficial insects, specifically the natural enemies that uh, were attracted to the plants that you, uh, that you used? Yeah, so I'm, I've always been interested uh, in most of my research focuses on biological control. That's the use of uh, natural enemies to control unwanted or pest insects. And we, we broadly have two large groups, the predators. These are uh, things like lady beetles, which uh, are mobile and they track down their prey and they consume them directly. And then there's a whole other group of natural enemies uh, called parasitoids, uh, which are typically small wasps, uh, but occasionally uh, there are flies that uh, are paras- act as parasitoids. And, the, and parasitoids lay their egg in or on the body of a host insect, and it's the immature stage of the parasitoid, the larva, which actually consumes the, um, the, the uh, host insect, ultimately killing it in that process. Mm-hmm. So we, uh, when we look at, uh, at 
or when we decide what we're going to look for, we, we certainly look for all of the predators, things like lady beetles or um, spine soldier bug, um, common uh, green lace wings and brown lace wings uh, are very effective predators. Uh, and many of these are highly attracted to these plants. Mm -hmm. And then we look for these parasitoids as well, which are, tend to be small and hard to identify, but very numerous and uh, very important in insect pest control. Mm -hmm. And um, what were some of the characteristics of, uh, of the plants um, that were particularly attractive to these uh, beneficials? Yeah, one of the things that Anna did was uh, to sort of ask herself, you know, in addition to, the, to testing these plants, what other information can she offer to, you know, the scientific community and to um, uh, citizens in general about what, what makes a plant attractive? And, of course, there's many things that make a plant attractive. Um, it's, you know, ultimately the amount of floral nectar and, and uh, pollen resources that are offered is very important. But she looked at other more indirect measures, and it turns out that uh, for natural enemies, the amount of floral area that a plant produces compared to the other plants that are blooming at the same time uh, is uh, quite predictive of how attractive it's going to be to natural enemies. So plants um, like yarrow, which have a relatively large floral area uh, for plants that are blooming at, at that earlier time of year, uh, turn out and uh, you mentioned golden Alexander is another mm -hmm. one that's a great example. It has, uh, you know, quite a large floral display and large number of square inches of flor flowering area uh, compared to other things that are blooming at the same time. Uh, these turn out to be a, a pretty good predictor of uh, of what natural enemies are going to be attracted to. And there is um, the the Canada anemone, the anemone canadensis. I was really surprised to see that because it never occurred to me that that was a particularly good uh, plant for beneficials, but um I guess it was kind of, you know, something available at that particular time of year. Yeah, it's um, it's rather attractive to natural enemies, only modestly attractive to bees. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it is uh, blooming at an early time of the year. Uh, in our in our climate, it tends to bloom in uh, May and into June. And uh, compared to the other plants that are blooming at about that same time, it, it's actually quite attractive. A, a little caveat here, I am a scientist, but, uh, so I have to throw in the caveats along the way. We were sampling a, you know, we were testing a comparatively small number of plants compared to the number of things that occur in nature. Uh, so I, I would say uh, these are not the only plants that are attractive to natural enemies, but uh, simply a good, uh, well-researched subset. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this particular report um, shows the relative attractiveness to natural enemies uh, as one score and then uh, to bees as another score. Um, and uh, you range, uh, these plants range from good, better to best. And uh, it's interesting, some of the overlap of plants um, that, well, I think Lobelia syphilitica, uh, blue Lobelia, was a surprise to me as being equally attractive to natural enemies and bees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, quite attractive to, to both groups while you have other plants that, you know, um, differ. Uh, nodding wild onion attracts relatively few natural enemies, but a modest number of, of bees. And, mm -hmm. and we see that uh, continuing in our current research. Uh, some plants um, are, are uh, very attractive to bees and not to natural enemies. And then within plants, uh, the, the specific bee uh, taxa uh, or species that are attracted also vary. Some plants are very attractive to honeybees and mm -hmm. not very attractive to wild bees. Um, others are just the opposite, quite attractive to wild bees and less so to honeybees. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't see that as uh, that that particular data broken down. Is that available somewhere? It is. Um, the uh, uh, it's available in scientific publications. Okay. Uh, but also on our website. So if uh, if your listeners were to go to native plants dot msu dot edu native plants all one word mm -hmm. all lowercase uh, they'll find profiles on all of these uh, plants that we've tested and the results that we find and uh, uh, you could find some of that uh, specific data as to which natural enemy groups or which pollinator groups were most attracted uh, to particular plants and the uh, the bulletin is also available for download and uh, this, this is really terrific to make this information so accessible to uh, to users um, really, really great. And, and you have new, um, new research that you've just published as well. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, the plants that we selected in the, in the uh, first testing that we did, again, almost a decade ago, uh, I think the, the words we use when we talk to the native plant producers are, are give us a selection of plants that are adaptable across, you know, sort of uh, 
you know, moderate soils. Uh, you know, we'll probably be in full sun situations, so we wanted uh, plants that, that utilize full sun. Uh, but we were not really stretching either highly uh, wet soils or uh, or very dry soils. And the current work that we're doing is focusing on plants that are more adapted to dry soils. Mm-hmm. So these would be areas uh, like on the west uh, side of Michigan, we grow a lot of fruits and vegetables, often on very sandy soils. And to uh, augment natural enemies and pollinators in those types of habitats, you want to start with plants that are adapted to those, to those habitats. And so this research really applies both to agricultural uh, practices as well as uh, home gardening practices, which is kind of neat. It does, and we designed it in that way. Uh, actually, we, we sort of sat down at the very beginning. We said, how could we get the widest group of people interested in this research and make it um, applicable to a, a wide uh, swath of, uh, of the public? And certainly, we had agriculture and, and farming in mind uh, for some of the applications, but we've had tremendous uptake from just people who are enthusiastic about native plants mm-hmm. and want to have them in their home landscapes. And I note that this new research, um, you have funding from a couple uh, groups, including uh, SAR, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and uh, Education. Um, So obviously there's some real interest here in trying to get away from uh, pesticides and veer more toward use of, of natural enemies. Yeah, so the USDA SARE program, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, has been a, a, a great program for this type of research. They funded our earlier research, and they're, they're funding our current research as well. Um, so I want, want to um, thank them for mm-hmm. that, that support. Um, they're really broadly interested in uh, how to make uh, farming and ranching more sustainable in the North Central region, and, uh, and they find this uh, area of research something that they're, they're highly supportive of. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we hear about beneficial insects, but um, oftentimes people don't realize that they, uh, many of these, these insects need pollen uh, and or nectar. So um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and their yeah. life cycle. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's start with the syrphid fly. Um, syrphid flies are sometimes called hoverflies. Um, they're the little yellow and um, black uh, flies that you might see hovering uh, around your picnic area, sometimes landing on your arm to, uh, to drink a little bit of, uh, of sweat. Um, and uh, hoverflies are quite interesting uh, as, uh, as adults. They feed on uh, pollen and nectar. And they, and, they, and they look like bees a little bit, they, don't they? they? Do. Little tiny bees. Yep, they're bee mimics, and they probably gain, or wasp mimics, and they gain some um, some protection in that way. Mm-hmm. But as adults, they require a pollen meal in order to, or many pollen meals, in order to gain enough uh, protein to lay a full complement of eggs. Uh, so that when they are uh, when they are hatched as an adult fly, uh, they simply don't have the amount of resources that they need to develop eggs. And the, the analogy is with uh, something that people are familiar with is mosquitoes. Mosquitoes require a blood meal before they have enough protein in their bodies to, to lay a batch of eggs. Uh, syrphid flies do it another way. And uh, syrphid flies then lay e- go out and seek patches of aphids in the environment, and they lay their eggs next to those patches of aphids. And the uh, the larvae are actually the ones that consume the aphids. So um, some of these beneficial insects are really uh, quite good pollinators like hoverflies, and some are more incidental. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, plants are, are using uh, the resources of, of nectar primarily to attract uh, uh, insects to them and uh, by way of re- and then rewarding them for picking up uh, pollen and moving it to, to other um, plants. Mm-hmm. And uh, Plants are displaying pollen and nectar in very sophisticated ways uh, to, uh, to optimize their pollination. And uh, some insects are uh, co-evolved to actually uh, you know, work with particular plant species. These are the more specialized relationships. Uh, and they may have special body parts or uh, for bees, the length of the tongue. Uh, from which they can drink nectar uh, determines how, what, how deep a corolla they can, uh, they can utilize. Um, but some insects are just uh, there and uh, happen to be uh, moving around in the plant. They pick up some pollen and they, they move it around. Mm-hmm. Uh, so most of our research is currently focusing on the, the more adapted pollinators, uh, bees and, and in particular syrphid flies uh, as a non-bee pollinator. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in this latest work uh, on natural enemies, now uh, when will that be available online? So we are in our, uh, we've just completed our first full year of testing, and uh, we've released some of those uh, results, um, the tentative or the preliminary results 
uh, in, a, in a rather abbreviated form. Uh, we'll be collecting another year's data and, uh, and then writing that up. And really in the fall of 2016 is when we hope to uh, have our new website up with, uh, with the newest information from the, okay. from the plants that we've been studying. So, so not too long from now. So I can, can I give a spoiler alert on a couple of this, uh, these uh, data facts? So yeah. um, it looks like um, yarrow was, uh, was quite successful, goldenrod, one of the mountain mints, um, uh, goldenrod, I see repeated spotted bee balm, one of my favorites, mm -hmm. Monarda punctata, that's hardly ever used in um, conventional landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, tall coreopsis. Um, these are some of the ones that did really, really well um, with your uh, beneficials. That's that's true. Those are all on a on a list of uh, plants that were highly attractive to both natural enemies and to pollinators. Mm -hmm. uh, we have you know we have other plants that are you know, really work well for pollinators, and if you had a pollination specific um, need, uh, they would be uh, they would be good. But these are good general plants. Mm -hmm. uh, Garrow is a great uh, and fun example. Um, I had a very low expectation for yarrow uh, when we when we put it out in our current trial. Uh, when I look at it in my home landscape, I rarely find uh, uh, insects on it. Hmm. Uh, but when we uh, when we take the wild type yarrow that we obtain from native plant nurseries and plant that out in the environment, it's very attractive. And so I've come to, to realize or to learn that, uh, and there's lots of active research in this area, that uh, many of the more highly developed cultivars are losing their pollen and nectar. They're losing their attractiveness because they, they provide reduced or sometimes even no uh, pollen and nectar resources. So the, the yarrow that I have in my home landscape is, uh, is a highly cultivated variety and, and does not seem to be very attractive, but the wild type uh, variety is. So sticking to the uh, straight species for the genetic diversity and the plant traits, sounds like it's really important, um, you know, to attract both the natural enemies and bees. Yes, uh, we're, we're becoming very, um, very much convinced of that. Mm -hmm. uh, on this uh, podcast uh, show, I've interviewed um, some other folks doing research in this area, and it's uh, surprising. For example, that yarrow, uh, the uh, forms that are, you know, dark red, et cetera, are really um, not attractive at all. So we're learning our lesson. Yeah, so the, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why working with these native plant nurseries, we're assuring that, um, uh, and we try to make that point then when we, get, when we uh, make this research public, is that you know, a caveat is that you could buy yarrow and, at uh, many home centers uh, that might not be very attractive at all. Uh, if, you, if you want that characteristic, mm -hmm. uh, you would probably need to go and get a more um, uh, native species that, or native uh, uh, genotype that mm -hmm. was uh, more local to your area. And likely from a native plant nursery. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned uh, horse mint or spotted bee balm, and that's a very interesting one. We've tested that uh, in our early work, and we're testing it again uh, in our later work. And we found that in the early work, where we were on more mesic soils, um, it is not a good competitor with, uh, with other plants. It really falls. It's attractive, but on those soils, it, it really falls out of the, um, of the mix pretty quickly if you're planting them uh, as a mix. Uh, whereas it's quite adapted to very dry soils and it's much more persistent on those sites. So uh, again, uh, people using this information need to think about the sites that they're, mm -hmm. uh, that they're planting as well as the types of cultivars that they're planting. That, that old adage, right plant in the right place. Mm -hmm. And the goldenrods uh, as a group are, are generally quite attractive to, to both natural enemies and pollinators. They have a large floral area uh, relative to other plants that are blooming at that time. Uh, early goldenrod, uh, Soldego juncea, is a, is a nice uh, early blooming species in our area. Uh, blooms in mid-season and is, is quite attractive. And then we have the late season uh, sort of sequence of, uh, of stiff goldenrod and showy goldenrod, uh, common goldenrod, which we're not testing, but um, uh, those uh, those come on later in the season. So uh, again, uh, someone going just by the the name goldenrod could be getting a, a wide uh, variety of species, mm -hmm. some of which are blooming at very different times. And and also word to the wise to make sure that you know whether you have a clumping or a running uh, goldenrod when that spreads mm -hmm. or one that has a tight neat neat habit because mm -hmm. sometimes we can be disappointed with our selection. Mm -hmm. um, and um, something that interested me. Um, 
I see that um, you you tried Hori Mountain, which was very attractive um, in some cases here to, to bees, but not so, you know, it was not as, as strong a performer um, to natural enemies. And I always think of that as a very strong wasp plant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, one of the things that, that you're looking at is these are these are still quite raw numbers. So okay. we're just going we're showing total numbers of natural enemies, and um, what really you could be attracting very important and uh, necessary natural enemies that maybe don't occur in very high numbers. Lady beetles would be a good example. Mm-hmm. One lady beetle can, you know, uh, eat many aphids in a day, and it doesn't take that many of them to be uh, effective. Certainly for wasps, for the larger predatory wasps, that's true as well. Some of the numbers you're looking at are driven by some of the smaller, more, uh, these parasitoid species, which tend to be quite numerous. Mm-hmm. And so um, as we develop this uh, work more fully, uh, we, we know that those differences um, are are present, and we, we certainly take them into account from a scientific point of view, but then as we as we put out information for more public consumption, uh, we at least try to, to simplify it to to a point where it's uh, intelligible. Okay. Um, and uh, in the in the natural enemies group, you mentioned spiders. how are how are spiders interacting with these plants? Yeah, spiders uh, are, are quite interesting. Uh, your listeners would be certainly familiar with crab spiders mm-hmm. uh, that, uh, that are often quite cryptically colored, and they sit on plants, uh, on the floral portions of plants, and they eat the insects that are attracted there. Um, crab spiders are, can actually decrease pollination because they are um, <laughs> they, they are they eat eating, the good guys <laughs> eating pollinators. And there's uh, some new information, uh, relatively new information, that shows that... Um, some pollinators uh, can actually detect the presence of the crab spider and mm. simply not um, uh, go uh, go near that particular bloom. Um, but spiders are, are very diverse, and uh, we have uh, various spiders that, that are we find in the plants. Many of them are, you know, the more uh, we would call them cursorial or running spiders, uh, not so much ones that build uh, webs. Um, but uh, we do have some web building spiders, but we have a lot of the uh, the smaller, more running and hunting uh, spiders, mm-hmm. and they're all predatory. Every, you know, uh, all spiders are predatory, so they're all feeding on um, potential pests, but also uh, in each other and uh, and other uh, beneficial insects as well. But on the whole, uh, I would say it's a good thing to have spiders uh, in your environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of people don't give beetles their due, um, but there are a lot of predatory beetles, aren't there? Yeah, so uh, the beetles are, are uh, you know, the, the one of the more hyper-diverse uh, insect uh, families, or, or excuse me, orders, and uh, there are a lot of different beetles. Uh, people tend to be very familiar with lady beetles, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and certainly they're very important um, uh, aphid predators. But uh, our work also finds lots of soldier beetles, uh, cantharidae. They're the yellow and typically in our area, they're yellow and black uh, insects that are attracted. They feed on pollen, but they're also feeding on uh, small insects uh, in the environment. And then we occasionally even get uh, insects that are more uh, ground-dwelling, like ground beetles or rove beetles. Uh, they will occasionally climb up the plants, and we, we find them on the on the blooms as well. Mm-hmm. And they're uh, predatory on other insects, uh, and uh, some of the uh, ground beetles uh, are, actually eat the uh, seeds of weeds, uh, so they can be beneficial from that perspective as well. And you're making me think of a very important point in order to attract natural enemies um, and pollinators. We need to be providing habitat too. So I think of beetles often as being ground dwelling, n- needing some crevices or stones to hide in, um, something that we don't typically think of in our landscapes. Yeah, our research uh, displays these plants in a in a very uniform setting. Uh, we do that very purposely so that we can sort of fairly contrast uh, plant uh, to, to plants, and we do that in what we mm-hmm. call a common garden. Uh, these plants are planted in one meter square patches, uh, and they are mulched and weeded so that those patches remain a pure um, stand of the plants that we want. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
in nature or in the garden. Of course, they would be displayed in a different way. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes leaving some bare soil is actually good. Uh, we have ground nesting mm -hmm. bees, and we they need uh, access to open soil. So if you have some sandy soil that you can keep bare, uh, that's a great place for ground nesting bees. Uh, stem nesting bees, uh, it's a good idea to leave some of the hollow pithy stems of some of these plants uh, from the, the year before. Don't cut them all the way down or cut them maybe uh, to just the 16-inch height and, or 18 inches and leave some of those pithy stems for as habitat for the mm -hmm. bees as well. And probably don't even touch those perennials until early spring. Right. Yeah. Um, well, that's uh, that's terrific information, Doug. What are what kind of research are you um, are you working on now? What can we look forward to hearing more about? Well, uh, I would say uh, sort of directly applicable to this. Uh, this work looks at. Uh, just a direct comparison of the plants uh, uh, attractiveness one against the other. Mm -hmm. uh, the application of that, in, in particular in agriculture, is uh, to put out um, groups of plants that bloom over a long period of, of time or provide consistent bloom over uh, the entire season uh, and are supporting both natural enemies and pollinators that can then, we say, spill over and have uh, positive effects in a crop uh, or uh, a garden type situation. And I work with colleagues. Uh, Rufus Isaacs uh, has been involved in this work from, from the very start. Uh, we've got a great set of students uh, working on these uh, projects as well. And what we're focused then on is as we place these plants in gr typically in, in, um, in, small, uh, in groups of plants, uh, 10 to 12 species at a time, uh, measuring the service that they're actually providing into the, into the crop field. Mm -hmm. And one of the great findings uh, that is actually uh, from my colleagues in Dr. Isaac's lab is that uh, in blueberries, which require insect pollination, uh, patches of uh, the plants that we identified as being highly attractive in our earlier work uh, were placed out uh, near blueberries, and they actually increase blueberry pollination to the point where it uh, pays for the installation of that habitat in three to four years. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. So there's really a complex network of, of things that are going on in terms of insect insect attraction. And, um, you know, I always try to remind, fo remind folks that succession of bloom is so important. It's not, all these, not all these creatures are merging at the same time, and they don't have the same lifespans. Exactly. So, you know, in my sort of... Uh, uh, concluding slides when I talk about this work uh, and people ask, you know, well, what should I be doing? Uh, you know, adding diversity to your plantings is, is uh, the message that I give. Uh, expanding the bloom period. So as you, if you have plants that are, you know, only starting in May, can you get some plants into your system that, you know, are blooming in April in your, mm -hmm. in your region and extending that well into the fall and having good overlap and variety at all times of year is important. Um, this variety of floral structures is really important because uh, we've just touched the surface on how these insects utilize these plants, but um, you, if you can provide plants that are displaying their pollen and nectar resources in a variety of different ways, you know, for example, some of them in deep corollas that uh, benefit butterflies and long-tongued bees, uh, then you're supporting those organisms uh, in a more umbiliferous sort of form. You're oftentimes supporting insects that have much uh, are much smaller or much shorter mouth parts, and they can easily get to the mm -hmm. pollen and nectar on the surface. That would be like yarrow and uh, golden alexanders, those exactly. examples. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then it's really important, we think, to include these native species uh, and, and uh, genotypes uh, in your plantings. Uh, you can be easily uh, misled by, by, as we've talked about before, by just the, the common name of a plant, and you see that uh, in the store. But if it's not uh, a native genotype, it may or may not be providing the mm -hmm. same resources. So sticking with a straight species. Mm -hmm. Well, this is um, terrific work, I think, really important work, and um, just thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. So, Doug Landis, um, please visit the uh, website. Give that website out again there, Doug. Sure. Uh, nativeplants.msu.edu is, the, uh, is our project-specific website. Um, you will find a variety of resources that are available simply for download for free there, uh, including the, the bulletin that we've been mentioning. Uh, if a group wants to purchase larger quantities of that bulletin, they can go to um, uh, shop uh, MSU. And, or shop.msu, and uh, there they'll find the, uh, right on the banner, is the MSU extension tab, and you can order extension bulletins um, in quantities through that tab. Well, th thank you so much, Doug. I uh, look forward to speaking with you again. My pleasure, Kim. Thanks for having me. 
This is Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficial. Thanks for watching. For more useful tips, please visit www.ecobeneficial.com. Thank you.